having us. Uh, so yeah, we're the Stets family. We are your missionary or your ministry partners to the country of Switzerland. Uh, this is my wife Erin, daughter Annika, and son Josiah. They're still up there in Cleveland for the day. Uh, give them a day off. Um, now, if you're still with me and if you haven't checked out yet, you are probably thinking one of two questions, maybe both of these questions. First one is, I didn't know that we had a ministry partner to Switzerland. Well, you do now. So that's a good thing, right? So that, that's one answer, one question you don't have to worry about anymore. Uh, the second one is, why are you a missionary to Switzerland? And I, I'd like to talk to you about, about that a little bit. There's, there's always two things um, that, that I've seen in missions. There's the need, and then there's the call. Uh, there will be needs everywhere in this entire world. For some people, you'd say, well, there's tons of needs here in America. Why don't you just stay here? Right, there are tons of needs there. But we got to go where God's called us. And that's, that's sort of what I want to talk to you a little bit about here. Um, so it was about a year into our term. We spent two years over there, and uh, a year into our term, and I just started asking the question to God, why? I, I asked that a whole lot. Why in the world have you sent us over here? God, why have you taken an American family, uh, you know, those, you know, and, and a great church and everything was going great. Why have you taken them and put them over here in Switzerland? God, we don't know the language. We're having to learn that and we'll probably never be great at it. So, you know, communication-wise, God, why, why did you send us here? Oh, uh, why are you, why, I really felt like God was leading us more away from the bigger cities into the smaller towns and, and, and places, that, you know, communities. And God, why, why have you been doing that as well? Why, why is that going on? And God was starting to make connections for us in, in one particular valley. And, and God, why are you connecting us with this church here, this small little church in a small valley? Why? What are you doing here, Lord? And it was one night I actually wrote that down in my journal. God, why? Where is this going? What, why, why are you doing this? And the, and the next day I had a meeting with a, a pastor friend of the uh, Swiss Pentecostal Mission. It's like the Assemblies of God over there in Switzerland. And um, I had lunch with him. Um, my kids were with me. My wife was away traveling. And so was my son and daughter with me. We found a Burger King, which are very few and far between over there. Uh, but it had a play land, and the kids went and played there for a little while. And he and I just talked. And he, he said, tell me the story. How, how did you get here? And I told him, sort of a long story. I don't have enough time to share that with you today. But I shared, shared with him the story of how we got there. And I, and I said, without a doubt, we know that God has called us here. But we just don't know why. And without missing a beat, my friend Matias, I don't have a picture of him. Uh, my friend Matias said, Oh, I, I know why you're here. With a big smile on his face. I know why you're here. You're here because my wife and I have been praying for a missionary to come here to this part of Switzerland. And so that's why you're here. Isn't it great how God answers our questions sometimes? I'm there because some guy in Switzerland has been praying for somebody to get over there. God works in crazy ways. We don't really understand how he works, but he does and he shows and lead us, leads us to where he wants us to go. Uh, in the future, we'll be planting churches with Pastor Matias and his family. Um, he is a pastor, not with just vision for his town and his church that he's pastoring uh, up in the mountains called, uh, the city's called Davos. But he wants to reach his entire state of Switzerland. There's, uh, Switzerland is broken up into cantons or states. He wants to reach the whole, the whole state of 200,000 people with the gospel of Jesus. And he can't do that on his own. So on behalf of Matthias, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for partnering with us. But as a part of the Ohio Assemblies of God, you guys are partnering with us. And um, I want to thank you also for just letting me share my heart today. I really appreciate Pastor Rusty. Thank you so much. Um, so the last two years have been it's sort of different for us, uh, being over there in Europe. Uh, from 2005 to 2016, over 11 years, I was a worship pastor at a church up just west of Cleveland, and the Sundays got church up there. Uh, this is my wife and I met, and um, had our kids, and everything was going well. And about nine nine years into ministry there, I just felt this strong desire to go over to Europe and to to go into missions. Is what we we ended up going into. 
uh, it has been quite a ride, and like your Pastor Rick was saying, yes, we had, we sold our home, our newly remodeled kitchen that was beautiful with granite countertops, and um, yes, and never to have that again. It's probably been the hardest hardest thing for my wife, you know, just to say I don't think I'm going to have a home again. I mean, maybe one day when we retire, when I'm like 90, but I, you know, she, I don't know if we're ever gonna have a home, and, and she's had to come to grips with that. It's it's tough to take your kids out of school and throw them to the wolves and put them in a whole different language. It's it's sort of tough to do that. But when God calls you, it all makes sense. It's all okay. He's got you, right? So you may still be wondering, okay, you, okay, we understand you call there to Switzerland, but why Switzerland? Why Switzerland? I think that's a very good question. And in order to do that, we sort of have to talk about European missions as a whole. Because European missions are a little bit different than normal missions or missions in other parts of the world. And in order to do that, we need to be introduced to a very special animal. And I'd like to put a picture of that very special animal on the screen. Does anybody know what this is? A platypus. Yes, very good, very good. And, and, and do you know where this comes from? Australia. Australia, not Austria, right? Because that's right next to Switzerland. I thought I was going to try and trick you with that one. But yeah, it, it comes from the country of Australia. When European explorers first started traveling into Australia, they would send back drawings of what they were finding. And they sent back a picture of this thing, and people were like, okay, quit pulling our leg. All right, yeah, okay, yeah, we know it was kangaroos, okay, whatever, but this? Why'd you put a bill on a beaver thing? It's, it's just, it's a weird, it's a, it's a strange, it breaks all the rules in the animal kingdom. Okay, so we've got a, a like a, a duck bill and webbed feet, right? We've got like a beaver's tail. It's about the size of a, a mid-sized small dog, something like that. Um, in its nose... I'm going to get sort of geeky on here, but in its nose, it has something called electrolocation. And electrolocation is, is it, it sends out an electric signal, signal from its nose and it wiggles back and forth like it has to close its eyes in the water to try and find food. Close its eyes and, and turns on the elect, electrolocation and, and it can sense where food is. And that comes back to it sort of like a bat, you know, and it sends out that signal and it comes back there. Um, it is a mammal, yet it lays eggs. It is a carnivore, but it doesn't have a stomach. It is, some fish don't have stomachs either. Uh, so it's sort of like fish in that. And then the, the thing that I really didn't know about was that it has a, a, a poisonous barb on the back of its leg that um, it can use when it needs to, to you know, uh, you know, if prey or anything. So, so it's sort of like a snake. In, in that realm. The platypus breaks all the molds in the animal kingdom. And missions in Europe is the platypus of missions. Sorry, I hope you followed me with that connection there. <laughs> like, so, so, European missions breaks all the molds. Uh, first of all, you have people groups there that have never existed before. Uh, because of refugees, because of migrated things, people moving into different areas, and then the mixing of cultures. You, you have people there that have never, people groups that have never existed before. Um, so in normal missions, you target a certain people group. But that's not so easy here. In normal missions, you try and target a certain religion. But Europe is the first post-Christian region without a dominant religion to take its place. But there's no real religion there at all. I mean, you could call, I guess, secularism a, a, a religion, and that's the, that's the religion of, mm, I think this feels good, so I'm going to take a little bit from here, and a little bit from here, and a little bit from here, and I traveled over to India, and I'll take some of that. And, you know, they, they just make a, a mixture, a hogmash, and whatever feels good to them, that's, that's what they'll follow for that day. Um, it's really the religion of self, secularism. And, and okay, so maybe, maybe it's there, but that is so widely diverse that there's, it's a moving target all the time. And then you have normal missions is a need-based mission where you have uh, the people have a need and the missionary comes with the resources of the church and helps to meet that need. But over there, uh, okay, so, so normally it would look like maybe water, uh, maybe you're digging wells or 
or building buildings, food feeding programs, maybe an orphanage, um, educational needs, you know, all, all of these things. Well, Europe, especially Switzerland, has none of these needs. None, none of these needs apply there. And so we come to Europe and, and we say, well, what do they need? Like, how, how do we open up the door to do that? It's, it's, a, it's sort of a tricky situation there in Switzerland to know how to reach these people. And then maybe, maybe you'd say, well, wait a second. Isn't like, isn't like a, in a Christian nation? Be, because, I mean, look at the flag. You know, it's a, it's a, it looks like a cross. And, and I've heard things and, like the, the Reformation that happened back in the 1500s. You, you've got major reformers, uh, Zwingli, um, Calvin, they come out of Switzerland. Um, and even Italy isn't that far away, it's just south of there. That's where you know, Roman Catholicism started. So what's, what's the big deal? You're right. 40% of the people in Switzerland are Catholic. 30% of the people in Switzerland are Lutheran. And 70% of the people that would say, I am a Christian of some sort. And yet when you really look at how it breaks down in somebody's life, less than 3% of people say that Jesus is my Lord. Wait a second. Isn't 70% of the people that are Christians? No. But only 3% are following it's funny, I was talking with someone just yesterday, and they, they were saying, yeah, uh, 3,000 people belong to my church in my village, there in, in Switzerland. What? Okay, so, so how big is your church? How many people does it see? Well, about 100. How many people come on Sunday morning? Well, about, well, maybe 25. But they all have to belong to it because the church is a state church, so you belong to something, you know? But it doesn't have anything to do with their lives. The history of Christianity in Europe has been one of power and control. It's been Christendom, not the love of Jesus. How many wars were started in Europe over the centuries because of religion? And that's what the people see there. They say, eh, we, we, don't, we don't need that. We've been there. We've done that. We've tried that. When we're talking to people there, we can't just talk to them uh, from a zero, okay, like a zero knowledge of who Jesus is. It's a negative five, it's a negative four, you know? We're starting off with all this baggage and saying, no, but, but, but Jesus isn't that. Jesus isn't control. Jesus isn't money. Jesus isn't you know, power over, an, over a, a, an area. He's love. The message of the cross has, has predominantly not been the message of the church in Europe. And so you wake up and you have a culture that wants nothing to do with God. And that's what we're going into there in Europe. So, what are we going to do? Folks, I still believe that the church is the greatest hope for this world. Right. It's not education, it's not money, it's not uh, you know, medicine or anything like that. It is the truth of Jesus Christ and what he does in our lives. That is what it is. So we're going to plant churches where there are no churches over there. We're, we're going to start them up. So, and I picture it like just lights just popping up all over in these towns and villages, all over in Switzerland there, to shine brightly for Jesus. Is there a church there in these towns? Probably a beautiful stone structure, uh, gorgeous windows, bells, you name it. But the love and the light of Jesus Christ is not being proclaimed in these towns. That's what we want to see changed. And that's what God has called us to. He's also called us to pray. And I'd like to talk to you about this prayer. Because sometimes God calls us to pray some weird prayers. Some prayers that don't really make a whole lot of sense. And, um, but they do reflect his heart. And I want to share one with you here. So um, this past spring in, in May, some friends of mine, uh, we, we joined together. And we said, we're going to take a week and we're going to pray through Switzerland in, in specific strategic places that we know God wants to work. So we met up with pastors. We, we went to places where there were no churches. We, we found out what was going on in those areas. And we just wanted to just take some time and pray and see what God was doing. So there's five of us. Uh, and we, we went to a, a city called uh, Kur. It's, it looks like Chur. And um, 
we went to the train station there, which in many European cities is still the focal point, the, the main part of the city. And we went there and we prayed. And while some of my friends were praying, I felt God just say, I want you to pick your eyes up. I want you to look around. Tell me what you see. Um, and, and so this is, yeah, this is what I started to see. And it was a busy train station. It was about noon. And these people, they started to gather in groups. I had seen, yeah, like lunchtime. And I started to report to God what, what I saw. And I, I saw young people. I saw attractive people. I saw people who looked like they were doing pretty well, um, healthy. Um, and then I, then I, I stopped reporting and I started getting missional with God. And I said, okay, so God, what, but what do they need? Like, what, what can be done here? How can we reach them? What's going on? And God said, be quiet. Keep reporting. Keep telling me what's going on here. Please show me. Tell me, tell me what you see. And right about then, I noticed that one by one, they started to smoke. They started to light up, which really isn't that odd. Uh, in Europe, a lot of people smoke. A lot of people. Uh, so it's, it wasn't really that odd, but this sort of struck me a little bit different that day. And I, I don't want to offend you if, if you do smoke, but what, what I saw, you know, I'm a judgy person, right? I, I saw these healthy people not look so healthy anymore. You know, because they're breathing in cancerous carcinogens. You know, I, I saw that they didn't look so attractive anymore. I mean, they're, they're robbing their body of oxygen. And it was like, okay, there's a little bit fuller of a picture here that I'm seeing. And, and then God started to speak to me. He said, this is what I see all over Switzerland. It looks beautiful on the outside, but I look at the heart. And I see what's going on in the heart. And there is death going on in the heart. Uh, there's no peace. There's no joy. There's, you know, a future that looks terrible to them. And these people are dying on the inside. And that's what I see. And God told me something really weird. He said, I want you to pray so that these people would be miserable. You know what I'm thinking here? Okay, miserable? Like, I'm supposed to be ministering to these people. Ministering is usually a beneficial kind of thing there. But he said, I want you to, I want you to pray that these people would be miserable. And so I can shake the inside and have it reflect all my love, joy, and peace. And so that the inside looks beautiful just like the outside looks beautiful. A couple of weeks later, I came across a verse in Isaiah 19. And this verse um, sort of helped me with this to not think that it was so weird to pray this way. It's a strange verse. And you are on the ball back there. Thank you. The Lord will strike Egypt. He will strike and heal them. What? Strike, heal? That doesn't go together at all. I mean, the mental picture of, of striking and the picture of healing, like that can't be at the same time. That's, that's not possible. But with God it is. And really, we'll get this into this in a minute, but this is the message of the gospel of Jesus. This is, it. This is something that only Jesus can do. That he can speak the truth to someone, a person, a church, a nation, a people. Speak the truth to them. Strike them with the truth. And heal them at the same time if they'll accept it. And so that's what we've been praying for these people. We've been praying, it's sort of more concise to me than praying that they'd be miserable, but that's the idea that they would be struck to be healed. And I would ask if you could pray that with us as well. That God, that you would strike the people of Switzerland. I talked to some of my pastor friends over there in Switzerland, some of the people. Um, yeah, just I just talked to pastor friends about this. I did not talk to people on the street about this. But I talked to pastor friends, and I was like, is it okay to pray this prayer? Is that all right? And I'm like, yeah, that on. Go for it. That's a good prayer to pray. So that's what my wife and I have been praying. Yeah, we, we'd love for you to be praying with us well. Because... In a, in a country that is, oh, they're wealthy. And they're a lot wealthier than we are. I mean, Ferraris, uh, Porsches, Mercedes, BMWs, all of my, my son can, can name those cars a lot better than he can afford. Uh, it's just, it's, it's something. Because uh, he's just used to that more, five years old. Um, 
But, but, but people that are rich, who have a beautiful life, but don't know Jesus Christ, die and go to hell for all eternity. It doesn't matter how rich or well off they are. And so we're praying, God, strike them with your truth. Um, so uh, today I'd, I'd like to talk to you about this um, in, in Matthew chapter 19, about how God does this. Because honestly, um, I'm sort of praying this prayer for you too. I, I'm leaving today, so you don't really have to like me at all. You know, it's okay. Um, so, but I, I was praying this prayer for you guys at all, as well. And, and hopefully it'll make a little more sense and how much love there actually is coming from me in praying this for you today and really the church across the world, that God would strike us with his truth. I mean, because really, we have to be, our eyes need to be opened to this. And like maybe we, we, we talk about someone, maybe a family member that's having our, that just not living life the way that we know they should be living life and things are really bad and they're destroying their life. They have to hit rock bottom, right, before they can come back up. And what does that rock bottom look like? It looks like them saying, whoa, my life is a wreck. I do need help, you know, some, something like that. And that's really, that's what we need to see before we can, before we can move up. Uh, this also happens with me sometimes with my wife. Um, so if a friend comes up to me and tells me the truth about something, I can sort of hide it. And, and accept it and say, oh, thank you so much for telling me the truth there. On the inside, I'm saying, you have no idea what you're talking about. I am not that bad of a guy. I'm actually really amazing. Um, and and you, 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 yeah, you're just totally wrong. I can say that on the inside, but I, when my wife says it to me now, I can't get away with that. <laughs> Be, because she knows me, right? And, and when I they really messed up with the kids, or, or I, I just told, I just, I, I, I forget something, or Oh, we had one of those wonderful come to Jesus talks, and it's just uh, she strikes me with the truth, right? Guys, this probably never happens to you. Maybe you have to do this to your wife sometimes. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to. The marriage counseling is coming in a few weeks here, um, but but this this happens to us in our lives. And, and really, my question for you today is, what are you going to do when that does happen? Because there's a few different approaches we could take on that, huh? But that, that's Let's go and see what Jesus does here in Matthew 19 um, when he strikes somebody with the truth and strikes them hard. Um, would you mind standing with me uh, as we read, read the scripture, just in honor of God's word, if we can just read it? Um, I'll read it, and if you can just follow along with me in your Bibles or up here on the screen, uh, that would be, that'd be wonderful. So yeah, we're reading from uh, Matthew chapter 19, uh, verse 21 through 26. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, teachers of the law, and that he must be, he must be what? He must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Now, we sort of see this as a, okay, we know the rest of the story, all right? We know that Jesus does go to the cross and dies, but, but for his, his boys... For, for his disciples, for his guys that he spends all his time with, this was a shocking bit of news, and not a welcomed shocking bit of news. Uh, and it, it hurt. I mean, they had to be scratching their heads like, wait a second, you've been doing all these miracles? You've been, you've been flipping Israel on top of its head? What? You're, you're going to die? So I would think that a lot of the disciples were thinking what Peter is about to say. They're probably thinking in their heads, but... Man, you got to love Peter, right? He says what everybody else is thinking. So here, here it goes. Peter, in verse 22, took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Okay, bit of advice, don't rebuke Jesus. That's not going to end well for you, okay? It just is not going to go good for you. He sort of knows more than you. So in verse 22, okay, you rebuke him. Peter says, never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. You'll never be killed. In verse 23, Jesus turned and said to Peter, Who get behind me, Satan? You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Can you say struck? <laughs> struck. I mean, Peter is on the ground. It's struck. He just got nailed two by four up across the head. 
I've never been called Satan by Jesus, at least not that I know of. But if he did call me Satan, that would have hurt. But then you have this man. I don't really know how Peter took this. I, I don't know what his reaction was to this. We don't see what it is. I'm assuming, though, that emotionally he's laying on the ground, writhing in pain from just being hit by his Lord, his best friend, his teacher, his savior. He just got knocked upside the head, laying on the ground. And this is what Jesus says to a man who has just been humbled by the truth. And Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life from me will find it. Verse 26, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? This is the hope that Jesus gives to someone who's just been humbled by the truth. And let's, let's pray. I want to pray that God will speak to our hearts today. Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity to read your word, to see your love, Jesus, how you interacted with people in a way that, that is unbelievable. But God, you work in these situations in amazing ways. And I pray that you would do that here today, that you would open our hearts. Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us, and you would speak the truth to us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, you can be seated if you want. So my wife has picked up a, a habit of, of listening to the Bible when she gets ready in the morning. Um, maybe 15, 10 years ago, you couldn't really do this, but with your cell phone now, you've got the Bible app on there, you can have the guy read it to you, and it's a great way to be able to listen to Scripture while you're just getting ready. Um, and so for me, like I, I picked up that a little bit too. Sometimes I'll listen to it when I'm driving. Um, and I was listening the other day to a place where, okay, where Jesus, it's in the Gospels where he's, he's dying on the cross, and he says, it is finished. And when, when Jesus said that, at that moment when I heard that said, I thought, yeah. I'm like, that's really what you came to do. Um, I think a lot about the three years of ministry that Jesus spent teaching people about this new covenant that's coming down the pipe that God has for everybody. And then Jesus, the death part is sort of like a, I don't know, it's something to complete the story, but that's really what he came to do, to, to die for us, but also raise from the dead as well. And in doing that, he showed us that God loves us immensely enough to die for us. It shows that there is a, a new way to be brought into a relationship with God. This is a fulfillment of, of everything that Jesus had gone through for a few thousand years that Jesus was completing this and making a way for them to have a relationship with with Jesus. And without this dying and the resurrection, none of this new covenant would be possible. None of this new relationship with God would be possible. And so dying was essential to the plan of Jesus. And Peter got it so wrong. He was so off. He didn't see it at all. And Jesus had to strike him at this point. He had to. Otherwise, Peter would wake up in a few years and be like, whoa, I totally missed it. what happened. And Jesus loved him too much. He wanted to keep him on. Come on, you stay with me here. We're going a different way that's totally different than what you would think. This is not power by taking power like you're seeing in Rome right now. This is power by giving it away, by giving everything away and seeing God do the miraculous. And so Peter here is publicly humiliated in front of his friends. I mean, just a couple verses before this, Jesus calls Peter the rock. And here he's saying, uh, Satan, you know, Peter's still in training here. He doesn't have it all right. And Jesus will do that sometimes to us, to wake us up. Now, like I said, I don't really know what Peter's reaction was here. Um, he could have been offended. He could have said, I'm not Satan. What are you thinking? That's not who I am. You don't even know what you're talking about. You know, that could have been going on in his head there, right? He, he could have been humiliated. 
he, or, or defeated, maybe defeated is a better word to say that, where you'd say, you're right, Jesus. I'm Satan. I'm such a terrible person. I never do anything right. I'm never going to be any good. You know, he could have had that. Or he could have been humble and said, wow, this is the truth. <laughs> this really hurts. But can you do something with it, Jesus? Can, can you change me? And this is what Jesus talks about in these verses here. So in verse 24. Verse 24. Can we put that slide up there? Man, see, you are on it. Pastor Rusty, you got an A, a plus player here on the team here. Okay. So there's basically three things that Jesus talks about here. For hope for a humbled person who's just been hit by the truth. That they need to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow Jesus. Now, for somebody who's at the top of their game, denying themselves, who wants to do that? You know, you just, you just won the Super Bowl. Who wants to deny that life, right? But for the person who just had his head knocked open, he's laying on the floor because the truth is so in his face and he sees, man, Jesus, you're right, I'm Satan. <laughs> like, I have nothing good inside of me. This is a really good deal. To be able to deny yourself and take up what Jesus is giving you. Now, if, if you're offended, then this is terrible news. This is, no, I'm a good person. I got this. But if you're humble, this is terrific news. And then in verse 25, he says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life, and they will find it. This, this particular verse, this saying of Jesus, is quoted more often in the Gospels than any other quote of Jesus. This one is in all four Gospels, which is a pretty tough thing to do because John can be sort of out there sometimes in the things that he talks about, but he even says this. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all say this in there, and then in two of the Gospels it says it twice. I think we need to listen to what Jesus is saying here. That the way of the kingdom, the way of walking with Jesus is to lose our lives so that we can find it. Now, the world would tell you that self-improvement is your answer, that you are good and you can do this on your own. You, you know, okay, a couple things, a couple tweaks, and man, you're, you're going to be golden. But when you get hit with the truth here like this, that's just not going to work. See, Jesus came not to make you better, but to make you new. Because the old person that you were, or the, the person, your old self, was too bad. It needed to be nailed to the cross and killed. It, 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 it was too bad to be cleaned up. It had to be fresh. From the, from the ground, a new creation. That's who Jesus made you when you made him Lord because your old self was too bad. So if, if you're offended by the truth when it's coming at you, you're going to say, well, I, I can get better. I can do this. I, I, it's all right. If you're defeated, you would say, I'm, I'm insulted. This is who I am. Like, how could you be so mean to me? I'm, I'm a warrior. This is just who I am. I'm, I'm just a self-centered person. This is just who I am. Like, how could you be so mean to me in saying this? Jesus didn't come to make you better, though. He came to make you new. And when you're humbled by the truth, you're able to say, Jesus, I lose my life. I, I'm not holding on to anything here. I want every good thing you have for me because I don't have it in myself. And in, in verse 26, it says, what, what, what can a person do if they gain the whole world forfeit their soul? Like, what good is that? If you're offended by the truth when it hits you, it's probably because you're working from a Working from a worldview or a religious view of Jesus that says, my achievements, my morality is going to get me where I, where I need to get to. And, and that's not the way that the gospel works at all. In the world, it says that you achieve, you get better. And then we can carry that a lot of times over into our relationship with Christ and say, okay, Oh, well, the Sermon on the Mount, man, there's a lot of things in there and it's going to be really tough, but I can do this. I can do this. I can, you know, pull up bootstraps and we can get it done. But that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying there's no way you can do this. But the world says you can 
And like I said, sometimes we carry that over into, into Christianity. The Bible says that your righteousness is filthy rags. That your, your, on your own, your righteousness, your deeds, your things that you do, it's filthy rags. Um, I sort of think about my currency. Um, here in America, I can use the dollar to go and buy something from the store. But it doesn't work that way over in Europe. I, if I try and use the dollar to buy, try and buy something at the store, they'll look at it. What, what is this? Switzerland has its own, uh, its own currency, the Swiss franc. All around it is the euro. But in Switzerland, it's the Swiss franc. And so every time we went in there, we had to make sure that we had francs on us. Because we couldn't use that money in there. It wasn't worth anything. And that's what your righteousness is in the kingdom of God. It gets you nowhere. And you say, well, maybe my achievements, maybe the things that I've done can get me somewhere with God. But honestly, that's sort of like going up to Mount Everest and saying, well, I have a doctorate in rhetoric. I don't know what you got. You know, what, what are you going to do there? I mean, that's Mount Everest. You can't say that to Mount Everest. And, then, and going into the kingdom of God and saying, my achievements are what, what's really going to get me there. God said, no, this, that, it's, it's worthless. It's nothing. It's nothing. But when, when Jesus hits you with the truth, he also heals you. In Romans chapter 6, verse 4, it sort of talks about what this is. And man, I've just been seeing this all over Scripture, everywhere. In Romans chapter 6, verse 4, it says, We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too may live a better life. Is that what that says? A better life. Does it say a better life? No. What does that say? New life. New life. That's what Jesus did for you. Like I said, that old man got nailed to the cross. It's dead. It's buried. It's gone. Just like Jesus was. And then through Christ, we are raised as a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. What does it mean to be born again? What does, what does that mean? It means that you are born and you are made new, completely made new. This is, this is not just forgiveness for sin. This isn't just as, you know, being set free from your own self-destruction. This is elimination of anxiety and fear and panic, all selfishness. This is true liberation that Jesus is talking about for the believer. That is the gospel. That is what Jesus has for you today. So if you look at your life and you say, while you've been shining the light on this area of my life, and it is awful and terrible, and I've been struggling with it for years, Jesus is just giving you the gift of the truth so that you can see that on your own, you can't do it. But through Him, just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we too are raised into the newness of life. And if and this may sound, sound really harsh, but if you're struggling with worry, anxiety, selfishness, if you're dealing with those kind of things, those are just habits of an old dead man. That's all they are. Now this is a process that takes like the rest of our lives becoming more and more like Jesus. But in your mind, what are you saying today? What have you caught yourself saying? I'm just a worrier. This is who I am. I'm just, I'm just that. Jesus didn't make you that way. At that moment when you said, Jesus, made me, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. You were a new creation, just like that in his eyes. And then for the rest of our lives, we are being conformed into the image of Christ. That's what happens to the rest of our lives. Um, my, my grandfather, he, he passed away a month ago at the ripe old age of almost 92. And uh, my grandpa's with Jesus, rejoicing, uh, jumping up and down with him. But for the first 50 years of my grandpa's life, he was a rough guy. He looked back at, when he was 50 years old, he looked back at his life and he said, I am, I just destroyed my first marriage. My kids want nothing to do with me. And I don't have any friends. These are his words. These are not mine. This is what, this is what I heard him telling 
preaching to somebody from his deathbed a week before he died. He said, that's who I saw myself at 50. That's who I was. And then I heard the good news in Jeremiah 31 that Jesus said, that, that God says, I will forgive your sins and remember them no more. And my grandpa said, man, can he do that for me too? Can that really happen? When, when my grandpa, who just, he woke up to the truth at 50, got knocked upside the head, looked at his life and said, I'm terrible. He saw, wait, I can deny myself and live my life for Jesus? Like I can take up a new life with Jesus? And that's what he did. Now, this wasn't instantaneous, okay? Now, in the inside, in God's eyes, it was instantaneous. He was the righteousness of Jesus. That's what was going on inside of my grandpa. But, but this was a process that took a while. He, I mean, I remember at the age, of, I was probably 8 years old, 10 years old, probably 12 years into my grandpa's journey with Christ. I remember being on the golf course with him. There was a constant disapproval that I felt from him and my lack of skills on that golf course. It was, it was constant. To this day, I do not like that game. <laughs> and I think it has a lot to do with how my grandpa was on that golf course with me. But then in, in my teenage years, I saw my uncle start coming around again because there was forgiveness. There was a restoration of a relationship because of love that was there that was never there before for my grandpa. I, in my 20s, I, I didn't have a job. I had no idea what I was doing after college. And, and I was living with him and my grandmother. All I got from well, my, my second grandmother, uh, I, all I got from him was, hey, let me open this door for you. Let me, let me introduce you to this guy. Maybe, maybe this route would be good for you to go. Hey, check this out. Never a, you worthless kid. What are you doing here, mooching off me? Not, none of that. I was reflecting on this and I was thinking, God, my grandpa is the greatest example of what you can do in someone's life. Where there was no love before in him, now it shone, shone through him. At 90 years old, he would start his third Bible study a week. And and I saw, I saw love in him. He's just, just, just was never there before. And I started to ask God, God, can I be the greatest example of what you can do in somebody? Because I know myself pretty intimately, you know. I, I, I know what goes on in my heart. I know the, the wrestle that I have in my head, you know, with maybe against my wife or something and saying, uh, well, she did this and I should get my way. And this is, come on, my... My level of loving selfish, selflessly is about a you know, negative two. I mean, I am, I'm terrible. But I started to ask God, can I be that new creation? Can, can you do that in my life today? And when I wake up 80 years old, 90 years old, can I look back and say, wow, God, what did you do in my heart? How did you change? This morning, i got a couple questions for you. Um, maybe, maybe you feel that God's been speaking the truth for you. And he's, he's highlighting an area of your life. And you're... Well, actually, the first question I want to know... Can we put those questions up there? I want to know if you even know Jesus. Have, have you made the decision to make Jesus your Lord? And may, maybe, you've, maybe you're coming in and you're saying... You've been saying for a long time, well... I'm not good. Because those Christian people, they're supposed to be good, right? And even though some of the Christian people that I've seen, they're not all that good. Um, and I don't want to be like that. I want to tell you that Jesus has a new life for you today, waiting for you. Jesus died on the cross for you. Jesus rose from the dead for you so that you can experience the exact same thing on the inside. Not just when you go to heaven. Now. It starts now. It starts today. Maybe you look at this, maybe you think about the truth coming at you and you think, um, that's offensive. I'm who I am and I'm going to stay who I am and nobody can tell me otherwise. This is just who I am. I'm stuck here. I can't change. How, how dare you say I'd be free from fear? How, how dare you say I, I can love people selflessly? This is just who I am. If you want to stay there, you can. But 
you look sort of foolish carrying a dead man on your back the rest of your life. Maybe you've been humbled and you want true liberation today. Every negative thought, every, every shortcoming, every, every selfishness. He doesn't point the truth out to rub it in our noses. He points the truth out to us to set us free, to set us true liberation in Jesus Christ. Who the Son has set, has set free to, and in the truly set free. I got a song for you, and I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Rusty. But during, while I'm, while I'm playing, if, if you just want to think about these questions, we got the other two questions we can put up there. Um, just, just spend some time with Jesus. Let Him shine the light in your heart, because Jesus not only strikes, He heals as well.
morning. If you are not a child of God, if you have questions of whether you're a child of God, we can't leave this place without having that question answered. I want to pray with you, but I want also the church to be praying with me, and I'm just going to be real up front. Last week I was talking with Brenda Phelps. She was so excited the doctors gave her news. Those three tumors were shut, shrunk, shrunk down to the point that they said they'd never seen anyone respond so well over, over such a length of time of having kids. And she was so excited telling me about that. Then on Tuesday I got word that Monday Larry had taken a turn and they took him over to the hospital in Columbus. I went Tuesday and spoke with him. He seemed to be doing okay. Then I got a call, a message on Friday evening. Things have gone very bad. They had to have emergency surgery Saturday morning. He's on life support and we really don't know from moment to moment. And I love Larry. I've gotten to spend some time with him, but to be honest with you, due to his health, I don't get to see him very often. And I just, I want to go over today, even if he's unconscious, and speak into his life. Make sure that he's ready. He's on the precipice of eternity. Ready to take the next step. I want to make sure that he's ready. But I also want to make sure that everyone in this room is ready. Not only that, we're going to pray also for our unsaved loved ones, our unsaved neighbors. I've had people get upset with me along this line of what was preached this morning. Are you ready to say, God, whatever it takes for them to be saved? As I mentioned a few weeks ago, God's just been dealing with me about the fact that we are not human beings that possess a soul. We are eternal souls that for a short time possess this body. And if we're making decisions based on a temporary body, then we need to rethink eternity. Are we ready to say, Lord, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, because I recognize that people need Jesus. So if you're here today and you're not ready to stand in the presence of the Lord, this is your time. If you are ready, are you ready to pray, Lord, whatever it takes so that people will find Jesus as their Savior? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I'm simply going to ask us all to bow and as we pray, if you need Jesus, you don't need me, you need him. You need to talk with him. The Bible says if we repent, he is faithful. Repenting means not only to be sorry for the sin, but to turn and walk away from it. If you're here and you're ready to turn and walk away from sin, then I want you to ask the Lord to help you, to wash you and to make you Father, as we bow our heads, as we're opening, as it were, our spiritual ears. As we're reaching out to you, Father. Lord, I thank you that this life on earth is temporary. But the life that we will live forever with you is eternal. Lord, if there's anyone here today that isn't ready, stand before you. Father, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice that isn't sure that they'll hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, don't let them leave this place without taking hold of you. Father, I ask right now in Jesus' name, as you are speaking to them, they are speaking to you, that they are praying and talking to you. 
They're confessing their sins. They're sorrowful for the separation that that, that, that sin has caused. And they're ready to leave that behind and take hold of you and live for you, with you. From this time forward. And Father, for those who are reaching out to you, help us to see their eternal souls hanging in the back. Open our eyes, Lord. That what's real is something that we can't get our hands on right now. And those things we can get our hands on right now aren't real. Help us to recognize the eternal as opposed to the temporal. The Father, to be willing to pray whatever it takes. that we find Jesus Christ. Whatever it takes, Father, we trust you and we put them in your hands. Now, Father, I thank you for this family that has been called of you to leave their home, to leave their family, to go and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray a hedge of protection around them. I pray a solid foundation beneath them. I pray your hands of blessing covering them. Lord, I pray what they left behind to go there. I ask that you would give them a hundredfold in souls. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We want to bless our brother and his family in ministry. The church always has finances that we will be giving, but we wanted to allow the congregation.